Let's continue exploring the universe within art and the art behind Redstone. I'm your host, Amla Du, and in this, our 12th episode of Let's Learn Redstone, we're going to take a look at how to actually use these logic gates and memory circuits in order to make complex contraptions. No matter how big or complicated a machine might seem, they are all made up of the same teeny tiny components. So if we just train ourselves to use these components and think of them independently, it will be much, much easier for us to accomplish the complex things that we are trying to do. So for this episode, I'm going to be using a door as an example that was requested by a viewer a while back. I'm going to build it in several different ways as we go along, using different gates so that we can examine how they affect the behavior of the machine. And near the end of the video, we'll even touch on condensing the redstone. But for this example, the request was a pay door. That is a door that activates when you insert the correct payment. So all we need to start off with is a door and an item filter. The item filter to determine what item needs to be paid in order to open the door. In this case, we are using diamonds as our filter. So we have a comparator looking at the filter hopper, strongly powering that block so that it powers the redstone underneath. When it reaches a signal strength of 2, it will turn off the torch, which will drain some items from the filter. And then we have some glass so that the redstone doesn't get pinched. And of course, we could always cover up this top hopper so it could still accept items, but the player could not interact with it. But when pulling a signal off of an item sorter, never pull it off of the dust. Always pull that signal off of the torch. It's just more stable. I've seen it skip activations when you try to pull it off of the dust rather than the torch. But the torch will always flicker one time for every single item that is going through the filter. But since this torch is always on, we're going to just start off with a not gate. You know, just adding a second torch so that when the first torch is on, the second one is not on. So as an item passes through, the first torch will flicker off, which will cause the second torch to flicker on. And so now we could just tie this directly to our door if we really wanted to. You know, except that without an extender, the door is not going to be open long enough for you to actually get through. So what we can do is add an extender. You know, we just need to extend the pulse that is generated by the knot gate or by that second torch. So we're just going to add two lines of comparators. Now we're going to test it to see. But one issue when it comes to using a long extender after a pulse is sometimes the pulse is not actually long enough to power the entire extender. So it ends up becoming a clock. So we're going to place a repeater next to this torch in hopes that that extends the signal just a little bit. But if worse comes to worse, we can just split the extender into two extenders. We know that having two comparators will work even from something like an observer that has a one tick pulse as long as the observer is going into a repeater. And so sure enough, here we have both extenders are now working because we split them into two. The first one is extending the pulse into a static that is long enough to actually power the second extender, which will just keep the door open even longer. But maybe we don't want to have a time limit for you to actually make it through the door, so we can replace the extender with a T-flop. Remember that the T in a T-flop stands for toggle, so now we are toggling the door between open and closed. So now, if we insert multiple payments, the door will continue to toggle between open and closed. And so maybe we want to add other activations to this, other things that can toggle the door between open and closed. Like maybe you need to pay to open the door, but then once you're through the door, it closes because you, you land on a pressure plate. Or, you know, it opens if you are inside of the room. You know, so you pay to get in, but you don't have to pay to get out. You know, so we can just add a pressure plate or a button and run that to the copper bulb so that now we have multiple things that can toggle the door between on and off. But maybe you don't want the door to be toggleable because if someone is on the inside, they could open the door for someone on the outside so they don't have to pay. So instead of using a T-flop where all of the inputs will toggle the door between open and closed, we can use an RS latch where each input will be designated as a set or a reset either an on or an off. So now the payment can only open the door, but our pressure plate could only close the door. So we've designated the right piston as the on because the redstone block will power the door when the right piston moves it. So now when we insert a payment, this will only ever open the door. It will never ever close the door. But if we attach the pressure plate or a button or anything else to the left piston, this will only turn it off. You know, standing on this pressure plate more than once will never ever open this door. So now there is only one way in this door, only one way to open it and one way to close it. 
But of course, you could always add other types of inputs to either of these pistons, either the set or the reset. So now the only way to open this door is to pay. Someone on the inside couldn't open it for someone on the outside. But maybe you don't want the door to open as soon as you insert payment. Maybe you want some sort of double confirmation, where you need to insert payment and then press a button. To do this, we just need to add an AND gate, like you see here. Now the payment is attached to one of the top torches, so it will need to turn off that torch, and something else will need to turn off the other one in order to receive an activation. So if we just use a lever, if that lever is turned on, and it receives a payment, you will get an activation which will open the door. But if that lever is not turned off, that will make the payment void. Because in this case, the payment only tries to activate as the diamond is going through the hopper. So it checks to see in that moment if the other section of the AND gate is turned on or not. So all we have to do in order to retain the payment information is add an input stabilizer so that we're no longer receiving a pulse from the item filter, we're receiving a static on after you pay. So we just need to add this input stabilizer in order to accomplish that. Now you could also call this stabilizer an RS latch because it functions the same. One activation will turn it on and keep it on even if you activate it again. It will not turn off until we actually tell it to turn off. So we just need to connect a reset to the redstone block so that it knows when the pistons successfully activated. So now, the payment won't have to be received at the exact same time as the confirmation. Once we pay, it will retain that data and just keep that torch turned off until the machine successfully activates by activating the other half of the AND gate. So now, as soon as we flick this lever to turn off that torch, since we already have payment inserted, it will open the door and then reset our payment confirmation. Now, of course, a lever probably isn't the best use of an AND gate, but something that has a pulse, like a button or a pressure plate, will work perfectly as a confirmation. So now, this button will check to see if payment has been received, and if it has, it will then open the door. So we just need to run this button over to the other half of our AND gate, so that it can turn off the torch. But now if we reset it, we can see that pressing the button will not open the door, and since the button is just a pulse, it will not retain the information that the button has been activated. So even if we insert payment, the door will not open, but it can remember that the payment has been paid because of the stabilizer. So now, as long as payment has been paid, if we press the button, it will open the door and then reset all of the stuff. So that's how an item filter into a NOT gate, a pulse stabilizer, an AND gate, and an RS latch all work together. But now let's say that you want it to have a payment greater than 1. You know, you want them to have to pay 2 diamonds, or 3 diamonds, or 16 diamonds in order to open the door. Now one thing we can use is a T-flop. A T-flop can be used as a 2-item counter, because it essentially halves the number of activations. The first time it's activated, it turns off. Then the second time it's activated, it turns on. Now we can also use a dropper to actually count the number of activations. But first, we will just talk about the T-flops. But we still want to use an RS latch to control our door opening and closing. But we don't want this T-flop to have a static on, because we wouldn't be able to close the door or reset the RS latch. So we know that an observer can be used as a simple shortener. So let's just start off with that and see if it works. So let's just connect our RS latch to the door and to our pressure plate. Now we're going to throw in a payment, and we see that the observer does not work, because the observer notices when the T-flop turns off, as well as when the T-flop turns on. So an observer essentially doubles the number of activations, whereas a T-flop will half the number of activations. So instead, we're just going to use a simple comparator shortener, a comparator that is simply being locked by a delayed repeater so that the comparator turns on for just a little bit before it ends up turning off. So now, whenever we insert two payments, we will receive an activation, and that activation will be a pulse, so we will be able to close the door again by resetting the RS latch. So with using a T-flop as our counter, it will simply ignore the first payment, but give us an activation on the second. And you can always string T-flops together, each one that you add will double the number of required activations to receive an output. So a single T-flop will require two activations, whereas two T-flops will require four, and three will require eight. So with this, since we have three copper bulbs, we will need to insert a payment of eight in order to receive an activation. 
because the first bulb only turns on every other activation, and that will only toggle the second bulb every two activations, which will then toggle the third bulb every four activations. So the third one will only turn on after we've inserted eight items, activating the whole thing eight times. Like so. So this is an easy way to make payments that are in increments of doubles. So like two, four, eight, and then if we add another one, that would be 16, and another one would be 32, and a sixth one would be 64. And so even though a T-flop is not technically a counter or a counting system, it can be used as such. And so that's a good thing to keep in mind, especially in regards to payments and reward systems, is that T-flops half the number of activations, whereas observers will double the number of activations. But of course, if we want a custom payment, we can just use a dropper. A dropper can count, you know, any number of activations one at a time by dropping a single item per activation. So if we just put three items in this dropper, then it will be empty after it's been activated three times. And a comparator can see how full a dropper is. So we will also need a not gate so that when the comparator is not on, meaning the dropper is empty, then the output will be. And vice versa. If the comparator is on, meaning there are still items in the dropper, then the output will not be. So if we toss in three diamonds, the dropper will activate three times, which will then give us our output activation. But of course, we will need some way to reset the dropper so that the items automatically go back into the dropper. The easiest way to do this is with a hopper, but you will need to lock this hopper so that it's not constantly pushing the items back into the dropper. And then we can have the unlocking part of this hopper connected to our RS latch so that after we receive a successful activation, it then unlocks the hopper and drains the items back into the counter, resetting it. So technically, there is a NOT gate attached to that hopper. So if the output is NOT ON, then the hopper will be ON, which means the hopper will be locked. But if the output is ON, then the hopper will NOT be ON, which means the hopper is unlocked. And now depending on how many items you're counting, you may need to increase the activation time. And once you've determined what gates and circuits you need in order to make the machine behave the way that you want it to, now all that's left is to compact the redstone. So really all of the dust that connects these things together is irrelevant. So we just need to find a better way to organize the logic gates and memory circuits that we already have that are actually influencing the behavior. So like this item filter and counter can't really be compacted at all because the dropper counter is already touching the thing that's activating it and the thing it's activating, those two redstone torches. But this shortener and this RS latch can definitely be changed and rearranged. We can completely replace the shortener with a more compact version. So if we use the copper bulb with an observer looking at the comparator, this is now the most compact way to make a shortener. Every time the T-flop receives a signal, it will toggle the comparator between on and off, which the observer will notice both times. So now we can just squish this RS latch directly attached to the shortener but we can't put it there because it's being powered by that comparator, so we just need to move it over one block in some direction. So we can actually place it next to this comparator and then place a solid block under the observer. So now when the observer activates, it will power that block, which will then power this piston. So we just build the rest of the RS latch right here. Now we just need to build the door. So we know the on will be right here because the piston that's being triggered by the observer is going to be our on or our set piston. And so now we just need to build the door somewhere where this torch can be toggled on and off. And we can place it right there next to that comparator because the torch won't be interacting with anything. That means that we can have the door be right here. So we still have an item filter, an item counter, going into a shortener, going into an RS latch that controls this door. But we squished it dramatically just by trying to figure out a different way to organize all of these gates together. But none of the gates and circuits actually changed except for the shortener. You know, they all remained exactly the same because they're already as compacted as they can be. But now we need to connect the RS latch to the unlocking part of the hopper. So that repeater can pull a signal out of that solid block, but this comparator is strongly powering that block. So we need to have a block here and not dust, but then we can just place dust on the other side of that block and we can move over the torch that is locking the hopper to be next to this dust and then place the torch right there so that it's still locking that hopper. And that's it. And really, the repeater and the dust that we added could possibly be avoided if we moved that hopper onto the other side to be directly next to the RS latch. Basically, when it comes to compacting the redstone, you're just trying to squish the logic gates and the memory circuits 
to be as close together as they can possibly be so that you don't have to run dust from your RS latch to something else. You know, or in this case, you know, from our pressure plate all the way over to our resetting piston. You know, if we could reorganize this where the reset piston was directly under the pressure plate, well, then we wouldn't need all of that dust. And really, being able to efficiently compact redstone is something that you will just get better at over time. But when you're learning, I would not worry about compacting it at all. You know, simply work with what you have, make it as big as you need to, but most importantly, try to break things down into individual gates and circuits, understanding their behavior and their influence on the machine as a whole. And the last thing I want to go over in this video is this example right here. This is the timer section from the MISS sorter that I made recently. So the first thing is what is the input and output? The input is when we have items in this dropper, we want the output to turn on. And the output is a clock because the clock is going to be controlling all of the rest of the stuff. So in between the input and the output, we have an RS latch so that when the dropper has a single item, it will then turn on the clock and just keep that clock on until it is reset. Then when the dropper input is empty, the comparator will turn off, which will turn on the first NOT gate, this torch right here. Then we have a shortener to turn that torch into a pulse. When that pulse turns off that torch, it will activate this etho clock to have it start counting down. When it reaches zero, that block of redstone will be shortened by a shortener, which will then trigger the reset piston on the RS latch, which will then turn off the clock. And now this is fairly compact as it is. I didn't use very much extra dust to tie these components together, but especially when you're first learning, it's nice to just add extra dust in between each component, just in case you think of something else or try to play around with something different. And then once you achieve the behavior you're trying to get, just try to cut out all of that extra dust. Or like in this example, there wasn't much I could cut out, but I could reorganize it into a different shape so that it fits the machine better. But all of the gates and the circuits are still built exactly the same. They're just stacked together a little bit differently. But we still have the RS latch that is controlling a timer, then the input that is being inverted into a NOT gate, and then shortened to turn on an etho clock, and then the etho clock is then being shortened to turn off the RS latch, which then turns off the clock. You know, it's all still exactly the same. Like the RS latch is just a Lego. The etho clock is just a Lego. But you can't really change these Legos necessarily, but you can put them together in different patterns and in different ways to obtain different shapes and different builds. So the first step in your redstone journey should be changing the way you think about these contraptions. You are not building one giant machine. You are building it out of Legos. Just learn what each Lego does and how to use each Lego, and you'll be able to build anything that you can possibly imagine. But that's all we got for this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to like, favorite, share, and subscribe, and be sure to leave a comment. But I am totally out of time, so insert the outro here, and bye-bye.